to me. I'm looking a bit foggy. Is that better? Like a light. Maybe it's just the autumn light shining through the window. It's not autumn, is it? It's winter. Mm, I guess that's okay. Just looks a bit, you know what I mean? It's a bit of a kind of glow, isn't it? Aim for perfection. And I think that's a bit better. There we go. Ah, people are arriving, and I've realised I haven't done the most important thing. I mean, you probably know, but if there's new people coming, sometimes people get a bit like, what, I just stare at this screen, do I, for 40 minutes? Start soon. That's it. Simple but critical message. There. Right. Oops. I will go and do my ablutions. That means put eye makeup on. I'll be back in two.
love this lesson. I guess talk to you about Jurassic Park. Where's my coffee? Oh, let's see the toilet. Ah, got coffee. I've got a sign science. And I get to talk about Jurassic Park. I mean, ugh, I've just got everything I need this morning. Oh, hello. There's lots of people here. That's nice. I'm oh, sorry that you've been hanging around for ages. Thank you, you lot, <coughs> for waiting so patiently. Uh, on, the board pens, God, it feels weird not having just a spoon. Yeah, okay, right, off we go then. Just do give it a bit of movement for the people who are watching on Catch Up who have skimmed through all the boring stuff. And, ah, hello, Science Alliance. Hello, it's me, Lara, trained to teach physics to A-level, which is good because we're doing IGCSE physics. She's really on the cusp of A-level. Ah. So nearly at the end of Forces and Motion, we've literally, I think, got one lesson left um, if you're watching live or on catch up. And then I'll do some sort of test after that last lesson. Uh, but anyway, today oh, it's one of my favourite lessons. We're doing about moments, things that turn. Before we do anything else, I want to tell you about my favourite film, the best film ever made, scientific fact, uh, Jurassic Park. It is the best film ever made, but... Um, we, we do have to talk about a certain scene. I'm going to describe a scene to you. It's a little bit sloppy. There's a storytelling reason why it's sloppy. There's a paleontology, like dinosaur reason, why it's not a great scene. And there's a physics reason. So obviously, um, you can try and find all three. I can't show you the bit of film because, like, for copyright reasons, but I can describe it to you, okay? I'm going to show you some clips, uh, some stills. So, yeah, Jurassic Park, this group of people have gone to a theme park with live dinosaurs in it. Spoiler, the dinosaurs get free. So this scene is near the end where basically Lex, who's a computer expert, can solve everything. But uh, the room where the computer is, there's a dinosaur trying to get in. So here we go. Uh, Dr. Alan Grant is there. You can see him trying to keep the door shut. Next to him is uh, Dr. Sattler. She's like a paleontologist plant expert as well. Uh, this is Lex in the foreground. She just needs a bit of time on the computer to get the system back online. So the computer's like, in the foreground there. And you can just see through this window um, a, a creepy, massive velociraptor there. So, so here's the scene from a different angle. Here's Dr. Grant in the background. Yeah, that's, that's the door with the dinosaur. This is Lex on the computer, and this is Lex's little brother, Timmy, here. Uh, so yeah, here's Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler trying to keep the door shut. Everything would be solved if they could just reach the gun. Oh, they just can't quite reach it. It's too far away. Dr. Sattler tries to get it, turns to Dr. Grant and says, I can't get it unless I move. Ah, oh, she can't reach it. What are they gonna do? Uh, well, here's Dr. Grant trying to get the door shut. The, a velociraptor claw has appeared around the side. Here he is again, terrifying dinosaur. God, I, God, I love this film so much. Um, and then uh, Lex and Timmy, eventually they, they get the computers sorted and I won't tell you anything else because when you're older, you should watch it. But there are three, at least three problems with this scene. Uh, there's a storytelling, there's a massive plot hole in the story, there's a paleontology dinosaur reason, and there's also a physics reason. So, well, don't, don't think about it too much, because we need to move on. But at the end of the lesson, hopefully you'll be able to tell me the physics reason by the end of the lesson. Okay, I just said to bring a tablespoon with you. Um, I just, I just want to give you like 15 seconds, put the tablespoon on the table, and... Think about how many different ways you can move this spoon. Like, actually do it. How many different ways can you turn a tablespoon? How many different ways can you make a tablespoon turn? We'll say that direction it counts as one. So, like, if I pick it up and roll it to and fro, that would be one way, okay? And, like, if I turn it around and do the same thing, that's one way. How many ways can you make it turn? One. Ten seconds. Do it. It is... We record, we think, is, is 10. Someone said they got 10. But it is impossible to describe what we're doing with the tablespoons to each other. So see if you can get 10. Five seconds now. You better be doing it. Everyone's got tablespoons. Do it. You get 10. Seven. Okay, let's go. Um, 
So today we're talking about turning forces. Such a gorgeous name. A, a turning force in physics is called a moment. Isn't that lovely? Magical turning forces moments. Um, the first thing we need to do when we're talking about turning forces is to work out what a pivot is. All the questions require you to know what a pivot is. It's easier to show you than it is to describe it. A pivot is, um, is what a thing turns around. If something is turning, it's turning around a pivot. So this is the classic, really boring physics picture of a seesaw. The pivot is this bit in the middle, because the seesaw is turning around the pivot, okay? Um, with your spoon, how many different pivot points did you use? How many different pivot points can you find on your spoon? So when I was rolling it, where's the pivot there? I actually hadn't thought about that, because it is turning. Well, I always think a good way of finding the pivot is if you stuck a, a little pin through the point of the pivot, then the thing should still be able to turn. So for example, come down here with me. Oops. Here we go. So if you stuck your finger on like the body of the spoon and turned the handle around your finger, uh, your pivot point there is, is where your finger's pushing down on the table, yeah? because the spoon is turning around your finger. And if you got like a pin and stuck it through that point, the spoon would still be able to turn. If you got a pin and stuck it in the handle, it wouldn't be able to turn, right? And if you did the other way around, then well done you. If you like uh, put your finger on the handle and turned the big spoony bit around, then obviously the pivot would be there. If you just spun it like that on the table, then the pivot would be in the middle. Yeah, like a windmill or something. I feel like you're getting it. Let's move on. Uh, so for knowing where the pivot is is quite important, so I have done you a whole sheet, just a quick sheet, on where's the pivot. I need you to work it out, please. And then there's some questions if you finish to get you thinking about the rest of the lesson. Here we go. Where's the pivot? There. Um, so we've got a door, right? A door opening is, is turning around the pivot. Where's the pivot on the door? Is it A, the hinge, B, the handle, or C, the door frame? <coughs> Excuse me, we've got a balance that you might think of as a pair of scales. In physics, we call it a balance, like the thing that Libra wanders around with. Um, is the pivot A, the little one of the little basket things, B, the base of the pivot, or C, the middle of the bar across the top? Um, three, this thing, people are telling me it's a car park barrier. Uh, is it C, the base of the car park barrier, A, the sort of hinge bit, or B, the very tip of the car park barrier? C, a pair of scissors. Where's the pivot on a pair of scissors? Is it A, the thing the scissors are cutting? C, the bit in the middle? Or B, the handle? Chopsticks. Is it A, the prawn being grasped? C, where your fingers are? Or B, the bit at the end? And a spanner. Is it C, where the nut is that's being like, unscrewed? Is it B, the long handle in the middle? Or is it C, the very, uh, A, the very end of the handle? Oh, that's a, that's a lot of saying letters. And if you finished... Then I've got some questions for you to think about the, the rest of the lesson. Question one is, what words might complete this sentence? A seesaw is still when the turning forces are something and something. Are those words going to be small, large, adjacent, equal, opposite, pushing, pulling, or squirrel? And two, explain your answer above with reference to Newton's law. Three, what's the equation for a turning force? Do not look this up. Don't look it up. It was not so important here because we haven't got comments, so at least you can't spoil it for other people. But honestly, this is brain exercise. Just looking it up and that's wasting a crucial brain exercise moment. Uh, just think about what the equation for a turning force might be. It's turning force equals something times something. What might go in those caps? But we'll have a little play around in a sec and we'll, uh, we'll find out. I don't think this is going to take you very long. I'll give you another 10 seconds. Mm, okay, 10 seconds from now, because I'm enjoying this coffee. I don't need you to get those questions finished, it's mainly about the pictures. Six, five, <coughs> if you're bored, you can always <coughs> like and subscribe. All right, on a door, where's the pivot? So. It's, it might be, seem strange because a seesaw, something's turning 
on either side, but the pivot, uh, the door is turning around the hinge. Is that okay? We'll talk more about that in a minute. So the, if you stuck a pin right the way through the hinges, I suppose, the door would still be able to turn. Uh, on this balance, it's C. Again, if you stuck a pin right through the centre of the bar, then it, the balances would still be able to turn around the pivot. Um, three, you might be spotting a pattern. Yeah, it's the hinge, okay? It's, it's going up and down, so the point where it goes up and down is you can always see someone's actually stuck a pin through that. Uh, the scissors, it's the middle, C. Chopsticks is where your hands are, so the chopsticks are turning on either side as you move them, so it's C. And the spanner, uh, this got a few people, which was good, because I like to be challenging. Um, look, well, think about where would you stick a pin in this spanner setup so that the spanner could still turn? If you stuck it in A, you wouldn't be able to lift the handle. If you stuck it in B, it would start spinning just like one of those little paper windmill things. So it must be C. C is where the pivot is. And the words that will complete the sentence, yeah, we'll look at that now. Okay, so I was talking about Newton's law there in the sheet. That's because if something is balanced, the forces on it are balanced. But because we're talking about turning forces now, um, we have to kind of change that slightly and say, if, if something is completely balanced, it's also because the turning forces on, on it are balanced. So if you imagine a seesaw, the turning forces that have to be balanced are the anti-clockwise turning force, whatever's on this side, and the clockwise turning force, whatever's on the opposite side. So here, here is the principle of moments, just so I can say that I've showed you it. The principle of moments, if something is balanced, the total clockwise moment equals the total anti-clockwise moment. They gotta be balanced. So say you've got, I don't know, uh, an apple on this side, Oh, I love drawing apples at the moment, and an apple on this side. Um, they'd, they'd both be, get rid of these, they'd both be pushing down with the same amount of force, yeah? Because they weigh the same, let's say it's, they're identical apples. It looks a bit weird, doesn't it? Because you think, well, those are two arrows pushing in the same direction, so how can the forces be balanced? But this one's trying to push the seesaw in an anti-clockwise direction on the left, and this one on the right, is trying to push the seesaw in a clockwise direction. So the forces from these apples, they're equal, they're the same size, same amount of weight, but they're opposite, yeah? Because one's pushing that way and one's pushing that way. Is that okay? So the forces on this are equal and opposite. Right. We need to talk about what the equation is. I think you'll be able to work quite a lot of this out yourself. I, I hope so. I hope you're going to be able to have a good guess. Um, oh, I don't have to write backwards. Brilliant. So... Are you okay with the fact that turning force and moment is the same thing? Moment is just a cool, weird word. I don't know why, actually. I don't know why we use the word moment to mean turning force. But a turning force is equal to something times something. But what? So a turning force, how much a thing turns. How much a thing turns depends on just two things. They're quite simple things. You'll have come across them or we've done them. It's nothing new, it's not like power or energy. What affects how much a thing turns? So I want you to, it's dangerous saying this, because people keep squashing their fingers, but I, I have faith in you, viewers of YouTube, to get this right. Find a door that you can push, probably the door to the room that you're in, maybe a cupboard door. Find a door that you can push without putting your fingers in the hinges and like breaking your thumbs, just sort of, Push along the edge of the door, like from where the door handle is to the hinges. Go and do it now. You're going to do it. Push a door and just experiment with what is it that makes that door open more or less? What affects how much the door opens? It's not a trick question. Go. Go to your doors. There is nothing interesting happening here. I want you to try and work this out. One of them, surely you've already got. So people on Facebook the other day were saying um, things like mass or weight. Um, it's not weight, because if you imagine a door, weight acts downwards, doesn't it? Weight is something to do with how much gravity pulls you down. 
So the weight of a door is a, is a force that's acting downwards. I mean, I suppose, yeah, I suppose that could have something to do with how much it opens, couldn't it? Yeah, because we've talked about how mass means, like, how hard it is to get something moving. So yeah, I can see that, but it's not mass and it's not weight either. Let's go over to my door. Have a look. Sorry, this is one of those really frustrating YouTube moments where I can feel you shouting the answer at me and I obviously can't hear you, but I will be looking on my Facebook page to see if anyone's left me any comments on my uh, Facebook post. Okay, here we have a door. Here are the hinges and here is the door handle. You ever wondered why the door handle of doors is mainly as far away from the hinges as it can get, right? And sometimes posh ones have them in the middle, but generally speaking, the door handle's really far away from the hinge. Why is that? Well, I'll try and push with the same amount of force here near the door handle. Okay, and then here near the hinge. Hmm. Let's do it properly. Let's push. How much has that opened? Let's push again. If if you have decided <clears throat> uh, that that how hard you push the door, how hard you push the door. Does that affect how much it opens? Yes, of course it does. So one of these is force. And the other one's a bit harder, but did you notice that if you push something really close to the hinge, it's, you have to push a lot harder to get it open. It, to, no one ever pushes a door open by putting their hand near the hinge, because we can just tell that it's, it's harder. So this one uh, is distance. But it's distance, you've got to be careful, there's a little bit more. Distance from the pivot. Distance from the pivot. So on a door, the hinge is the pivot, yeah? So the closer you are to the pivot, the harder it is to open. And if you're further away from the pivot, um, someone, I can't think it was Luke, suddenly said on face in this Facebook lesson yesterday, I oh, like a lever. Yes, Luke, exactly like a lever. So if there's a rock here, <laughs> and it's, you have to excuse my drawing, and a person trying to lift the rock with their tiny little human arms. Very, very difficult to do. What this person might do, in fact, probably did do thousands of years ago, is use a lever, yeah? Same person uh, using a lever to get under the rock. Can you see that the pivot is here, right? If you stuck an imaginary pin through that point just where it's touching the rock, you would still be able to leave for it. But yeah, what this person has done is very cleverly um, made the distance from the pivot really big. Yeah, so if it was just your arm trying to lift the rock, then the, the distance from the pivot is only as long as your arm. Whereas if you get a really big long lever, uh, this distance is big. So if distance is bigger and you're using the same amount of force as you were before, the turning force is bigger. You can lift the rock. Why? I don't know. I'm not a historian. Right, um, let's, let's put this into practice and then I'll give you some questions to do. So, do, 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 do. let's say that there's a six Newton weight pushing down on this side of a seesaw on the right hand side. Uh, and that is two meters away from the pivot. Okay, now let's say that there's a four Newton weight on this side, oops, draw a bit further away, you see what I'm getting at here, four newtons of weight on this side, pushing down, and that one is three metres from the pivot. What's going to happen to this seesaw? Wow, that's not good writing, is it? Sorry. Well, anyway, turning force, how much the seesaw is turning on this right-hand side is force times the distance from the pivot, so the, the force the turning force on this side, what we call the, the clockwise turning force, how much the seesaw wants to turn in the clockwise direction, is just six newtons times two. Wow. Saying the word six, writing the word two, uh, which is 12, yeah? And on this side, you would do the force four newtons times three meters, which is, oh, gasp, it's also 12. So this seesaw would be balanced, yeah? This is why, if you've ever been on a seesaw uh, with an adult, or if you are the adult and you're on a seesaw with a child, you've got to shimmy up to the nearer the pivot, because if I get on the end and my four-year-old gets on, and then we're the same distance from the pivot, I weigh more, so the turning force is going to be hugely more in my direction. She's going to go flying. <laughs> it wouldn't be funny. Um, the final
final question before we go on for an example in your little maths questions to do. What are the units of turning force? Hopefully this is making you really irritated. Like, Mama, what have you done? That's not an answer, that's just a number. What's the unit? How do you work out a unit of a thing? Well, you, what you do to the numbers, you just do to the units, yeah? Got five seconds. What are the units of turning force moments? Three, two, one. You just do the units and you, you just do whatever you do to the numbers. So the unit, force is measured in newtons. Distance is measured in metres. And you're just times in them together. And in maths, if you're times in, you can just put the things next to each other. So the unit of turning force is the newton meter. Well done if you got that. And if you didn't, doesn't matter. You know it now. <laughs> okay, one more example on the board and then I'm going to give you some questions to do. Uh, I've invented a hilarious game. A hilarious game for dogs. Dogs sit on seesaws and one of them gets dunked in slime. So you need to work out which dog gets dumped, dunked in the slime in each scenario. Here we go. So here's Patch. Patch weighs five newtons and is one metre from the pivot. He's really not, is he? But let's pretend. Uh, and Fluffy weighs four newtons and she's two metres from the pivot. Which one's going to get dunked? So let's work out Patch's um, anti-clockwise turning force first. So the anti-clockwise moment is the force times the distance, which is five newtons, Fluffy's Patch's weight, times one metre, his distance from the pivot. So Patch is producing a turning force on the seesaw of five newton metres in the anti-clockwise direction. Got Fluffy over here. Um, her turning force is her force, which is four newtons times two metres. So her turning force is eight me newton metres, uh, which is obviously greater than five. So Fluffy would get dunked in this situation. Right, here you go. Ooh, that's a lot, isn't it? Uh, it's quite simple though, you shouldn't even need a calculator really. Can you calculate who gets dunked in these different scenarios? So Patch weighs five newtons, Shep weighs eight newtons, Patch is three metres from the pivot, Shep is two metres from the pivot, who gets dunked? Uh, Smoochie weighs three newtons and is three metres from the pivot, La La weighs six newtons and is three metres from the pivot, who gets dunked? If Tinks is two metres uh, away from the pivot and two newtons, and Fluffy is four newtons and one metre away from the pivot, who gets dumped. This one's a bit different. So we've got Gumdrop, who weighs 10 newtons and is three metres from the pivot. And Janet, who is two metres from the pivot, but we don't know her weight. If the, if the seesaw is balanced, how much does Janet weigh? Uh, the next one, we've got Woofy weighs one newton and is five metres from the pivot. Tinks weighs two newtons and is 200 centimetres from the pivot. Who gets dumped? And finally, Terry weighs five newtons and is three metres from the pivot. Doggo weighs one kilogram and is five metres from the pivot. Sorry, two metres from the pivot. Who gets dunked? And if you finish that, uh, then I've got a little puzzle for you. There's a picture here of a seesaw with two balls on it. And the seesaw is tipped to the left. The balls are the same distance from the pivot, though. And they're the same size. So how has one caused the seesaw to turn? Just write one of the questions on the board while you're doing that.
Are you done? So I've completely lost track of time as usual. I suspect you're probably done, are you? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I can feel you getting really annoyed about the middle question, the little puzzle with the ball. Some of you just got it straight away, and some of you were really struggling yesterday. Um, it's nothing to do with the seesaw being like weighted. It's not a, it's not a trick question. It's just a physics question. I'll give you. Um, yeah, it's really not hard maths, that, is it? It's just there's a couple of little sneaks in the last one. I'll give you ten seconds. <coughs> Oh my goodness. <coughs> oh. <coughs> I don't know whether learning about pathogens in home ed has made having a cold feel worse or better. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's do this. So, question one. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Uh, the, let's do the anti-clockwise turning force. So the anti-clockwise turning force is the force times the distance, which is Patch's force, which is five newtons, times his distance, which is three meters. So Patch is producing a turning force on the left-hand side of 15 newton meters, but Shep's turning force in the opposite direction is eight newton meters times two, uh, which is 60 newton meters. So Shep is going to get dunked. Give yourselves, I don't know, a mark for each of these. Give yourselves marks for the newton meters as well. Let's really get used to using the units. Smoochie and Lala, uh, you do Smoochie's force times distance, which is 9 newton metres, and Lala's force times distance, which is 6, 12, 18 newton metres, so it's Lala who gets dunked. Uh, Tinks, you do 2 times 2, which is 4, and Fluffy, oh, it's 4 times 1, which is also 4, so this seesaw is balanced, well then, if you got that. Um, how These dogs are balanced, how much does Janet weigh? <clears throat> I'll go through this one on the board. So if Gumdrop weighs 10 newtons and is three metres from the pivot, how much does Janet weigh if she's two metres from the pivot? Well, come and have a look. So I've put uh, Gumdrop's moment, I've always wanted to write that on the board, is just 10 newtons, their weight times their distance. So Gumdrop's producing a turning force of 30 newton metres. Um, and I've put that Janet's weight equals a force, all right? This is kind of to tell an examiner that I know that. Um, because that's what's pushing down on the seesaw on that side. So, <coughs> excuse me. So this is why I've had to rewrite the equation, because I'm going to rearrange an equation, and I don't like to do that without being able to see it. So I know that moment equals force times distance. So if we want the force, we've got to rearrange this equation to be force equals moment divided by distance, okay? Because we're looking for the force, which is Janet's weight. Um, because the seesaws are balanced, they had to tell us that. But because the seesaws are balanced, we can say that the turning force on Janet's side is the same as the turning force on Gumdrop's side, yeah? Only because it's balanced. Uh, which is 30 newton metres divided by 2 metres, which is 15... Oops. Careful, what's the unit here? This is why you always put your units in the working out, because I actually made a mistake yesterday on Facebook, I was on uh, Automatic Pilot and I wrote Newton meters, and then I did what I always do. I looked back at the equation and I checked and I thought, oh, look, that's weird, these meters cancel out, so I've got an answer in Newtons. And then I was like, oh yeah, because it's the question where I'm looking for a force. So let's just, just always check that your units have worked out. It's a really easy way of not making mistakes in exams, because it might well be a mark putting the right unit. Uh, okay, so... Uh, Janet was getting dunked. Oh no, we didn't need, need to know who was getting dunked. They were balanced, weren't they? Um, so yeah, in this one, you just had to spot that Tinks' distance from the pivot was in centimetres. So there's 100 centimetres and a metre, yeah? So 200 centimetres equals two metres. So then you were just doing one times five on Woofy's side and two times two on Tinks' side. So that's five newton metres for Woofy and only two newton, four newton metres for Tinks. So Woofy's getting dunked. And finally... Oh, a uh, nice bit of revision here for you. <coughs> Terry weighs five newtons and is three metres from the pivot. Doggo doesn't weigh one kilogram, do they? Doggo's mass is one kilogram. That doesn't tell us anything. That's not a force. That's not got a direction. That's not mass. It's not pushing down on anything. So we've got to do a little bit of uh, a little bit of weight revision. For some of you, this is going to be really obvious and you're going to be sick of me talking about it. Good. I'm glad if this stuff is getting obvious, that's fine. We'll go through it anyway. Someone pointed out something on Facebook and I realised I've 
I might have got a bit uh, lazy. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Doggo weighs, doggo's mass is one kilogram because mass is measured in kilograms, yeah? How do we work out the weight? Do you remember the equation for that? Something's weight equals its mass times something called little g. So mass obviously measured in kilograms. Um, weight is how much you're being pulled down to earth and it's your mass times little g which is how strong its gravitational field is all right so um what are the units for little g can you remember it's how much gravity is pulling on your mass so it's how many newtons per kilogram a person experiences so the unit for little g is newtons per kilogram is that okay so for, for like a one a one kilogram thing on earth gets pulled with a force uh, of 10 newtons per kilogram because little g on earth is equal to 10 newtons per kilogram is that all right one kilogram mass of st every kilogram on earth gets pulled on with a force of 10 newtons could be different on different planets yeah you're all right with that aren't you it's different on the moon but g on earth happens to be 10 newtons of force being pulled on each kilogram, except as someone pointed out actually uh, for IGCSE, I keep calling it 10 because it's easier for the maths, but in IGCSE actually, uh, you have to know that it's 9.8. I think if they don't generally, if they don't give you the number in an exam question, they usually accept you using 10, it's usually fine. But if you want to use 9.8, then good on you. At A level, you find out that it's 9.81, but let's not concern ourselves with that for now. Uh, yes, so right, doggo only, mass is only one kilogram. So you just do one kilogram, that's been pulled on by 10 newtons, so doggo's weight is uh, is 10 newtons. And then we can do the sum. So it's actually five times three on Terry's side, which is 15 newton meters. Oops, oh, don't make me go through all that again. Uh, but 10 times two on this side, which is 20 newton meters. So doggo is getting dunked. Oh, I'm going to have to go through all those. Um, bum, 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 bum. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I just wanted to show you that you can add moments together. I'm not going to give you loads of questions on this because you'll get some for homework. But if we've got a scenario where there's a dog, two dogs on one side, one's pushing, got a mass of, nah, one weighs five newtons and it's three meters from the pivot. And tiny little tinks is two newtons and one meter from the pivot. And then you've got another dog on the other side who weighs four newtons and is five meters from the pivot. Um, it's not rocket science. Luckily, you just add them up. So add up all the anti-clockwise forces on the two dog side. You would do... This dog, three metres and the pivot and five newtons, you do their turning force, and then you'd add it to Tinks's turning force. So all together, you get an anti-clockwise moment of 50 newton metres plus two newton metres, which is 17 newton metres pushing down on that side. And on the other side, uh, it's just the standard, this dog weighs four newtons and is five metres from the pivot, so it becomes 20 newton metres. And obviously 20 newton metres is still more than 15 newton metres, 17 newton metres, so uh, that dog gets dumped. Right. <sighs> Can we go back to the Jurassic Park bit? No, not quite. <laughs> I've got one more question for you, just to see how much you've picked up on, and then we'll go through uh, the Jurassic Park scene and, and see if you've probably already worked out what the problem is. But here we go. I've got, imagine that these are just, I don't know, some sort of toy dog wheel, so it doesn't have any batteries, there's no force driving the wheel, it's more like a hamster wheel. This dog has been placed in different positions on the wheel. Which position is going to give the wheel the greatest turning force? So uh, we've got a dog who is just exactly on top of the wheel, like perfectly in the centre on top, and that, that distance is 10 metres. We've got a dog which is in the first carriage down, so a little bit lower than the second dog and slightly to the left. And if you imagine a line drawn horizontally through the centre of the wheel. They are eight metres above that line just on the left. And we've got the final dog who is sort of on that horizontal line, like 90 degrees from the top. So at uh, three o'clock, basically, if the wheel was a clock and they are 10 metres away from the centre of the wheel. Which one of those wheels is going to experience the greatest turning force if the moments are identical? This is based on an IGCSE question that got people really confused.
Should I give you five seconds? Because really, I think if you can see it, you can see it. And if you can't, you can't. Four, three, two, one, and stop drawing a dog. Here we are. So the first one, this is a dog, right? On, on top of a wheel. You can tell it's got a tail and everything. Um, this one is actually, can you see that the pivot is the centre of the wheel? So this dog is actually sitting on the pivot. So its distance from the pivot is zero, yeah? It's, it's right over the pivot, it's above it, but it's like standing in the middle of a seesaw. The, there would be zero turning force. So it's not going to be that one. Um, this one, they were sort of trying to trick you because they gave you the wrong distance. They gave you this distance here, which is just a line from where the dog is to kind of a horizontal line going through the pivot. But that isn't distance from the pivot, is it? Don't forget that when we talk about distance, it's distance from the pivot. They will try and catch you out with this a lot. Uh, so it wasn't that one either. It was the one where the dog was directly to the right of the pivot because that distance was the longest distance from the pivot. Is that okay? Well done if you got that. Okay. Right then, just before we go, um, let's go back to Jurassic Park. See if you found the storytelling reason why this scene wasn't great, and the dinosaur reason, and the physics reason. So, they're trying to keep the door shut. Oh, they can't, the, the dinosaur's trying to get in. The first problem, which I hadn't noticed until someone pointed out on Facebook, is this dinosaur is massive. It's a velociraptor. It's, it's taller than a man. So, thanks to... Paleo-Neolithic, doing this brilliant diagram on uh, Wikipedia, we can see that all the species of Velociraptor are absolutely tiny, like up to a human's knees. So that's the first problem, is the Velociraptor is too big. But, you know, it's a nineties. We didn't know this stuff. The second is the storytelling problem. Tim, what are you doing? Just, Tim, put, look behind you, dude. There's a... Why even have Tim there? He's not doing anything. He could easily get the gun and the film would be over much faster. But the physics reason is... Well, what do you think? Look at their positions. I can't get it unless I move, says Dr. Sattler. Dr. Sattler, you're about, you're about 20 centimetres away from the pivot. So next lesson we'll do about centre of mass. But how much turning force is Dr. Sattler providing to the door there? Hardly any at all. She could easily get the gun. Um, she's not producing very much turning force, yeah? Because the distance from the pivot is so small. Um, even, to be honest, Dr. Grant, I think, should budge up a bit. Look where his centre of mass is. His shoulder's like... A good, what, 40 centimetres or more away from the edge of the door. If you are ever stuck, if you're ever stuck in a room and a velociraptor is trying to get in, just be as far away from the pivot as you can. Yes. Yeah, I don't know, paleontologists don't have the basic physics skills they need to survive. Thank you so much for joining me for this uh, GCSE physics lesson. Like I say, one more next week on uh, Centre of Mass. If uh, you will need to bring a pin and a cereal box, a piece of cotton thread and some blue tackle play-doh, a piece of paper and some scissors. And did I say sellotape? Bring all those things. We're going to have lots of fun on probably my favourite uh, physics force and motion lesson that I teach. And then, like I say, we'll do some recapping. So some, just a few tiny little subjects that maybe only appear on one specification and not the other. So we'll do the last lesson of the term, I think, as kind of mopping up and then the first lesson after Christmas, I'll give you a bit of a sort of test lesson as good revision. Uh, right, you lot, if you want to support me, then you can. I am wildly grateful for your support. If you go to my About section on uh, YouTube, then it takes you to this website where people have signed up to support me with five or six pounds a month, which is enough to keep me going. Not only enough that I can do this as an actual job, but I will send you Theatre Science magazine, so thank you. If you're watching this live, or soon after I've recorded it, then the Christmas issue of my Theatre Science magazine is out of the printers, and you're going to get a little like pine tree bunting craft that you can make, and a little pine cone craft, and there's a Christmas tree spotting cut. I'm very excited about it. And I'll send you some rainbow glasses too, which make you see rainbows. Even if you're like really old and doing IGCSE, they'll probably be helpful for science reasons when we do light. Okay, anyway, so add ends. Thank you so much for coming, you lot. I will just nip over to my Facebook page. And then, uh, oh my goodness, we've got an all-ages home ed lesson in 15 minutes on Facebook, which I should be going to get ready for. I'll just go to my Facebook page and see if any of you have left me any comments, though. Should have been doing that while I was whittling on about my ad. Sorry. It's in the About section. I always do that.
Is it there? I think it's there. It's a tab. Anyway, if you have not left me any comments on my Facebook page, then why not? And you are free to go. Because that's the end of the lesson. Just going to say hi to Chloe. Might be Chloe here. Maybe. No pressure, Chloe. Oh yeah, thank you. You can also like this video if you want to. That's very good. I don't really know why it's good, but I... People say it a lot, so it must be good. It'll please, please the YouTube gods. Not a single comment. Are you kidding me? I could have logged off three minutes ago. All right. Well, I love you a lot too. I'll see you later. Bye.